Happy Monday and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes, joined by our colleague Mona Charon, who is who is the host of her own podcast, Beg to Differ, which you can also find at the Bulwark. So uh, again, ha- ha- happy Monday. It's going to be an interesting week, Mona. Thank you, Charlie. It is going to be a very interesting week. You know, and I was thinking this morning that uh, that I was nostalgic for a time when the world was a coherent place. <laughs> Do you, do you know what? Do you know what I mean? When when A happened, B would also happen. When when somebody did something crazy, everybody would go, "Well, that's kind of crazy." As opposed to the world that we live in now. Did you see? Did you happen to see last week? I think I put it in Slack, but maybe I didn't. Um, the text, the the, uh, the Twitter message from um, John O'Sullivan, former editor of National Review magazine. Um, responding to somebody and agreeing that they missed the times during the Trump administration because things that. were more sane. <laughs> That's what they said. Things were more sane during the Trump administration. Just quite, I mean, you could say many things, but that is not the word I would choose. I, I, I'm almost, when I read things like that, I, I'm almost tempted to say, I, I would like to sample the red pill that these guys must take. <laughs> I, I mean, I would just like to like try the drug to see if I can at least get some sort of, of, a, of, of coherence on all yeah. this, because, because I, I, I don't know. So l- let's start with this weekend, because there were a lot of interesting things that happened this, this weekend. Um, Dan Crenshaw went back and forth on Meet the Press, uh, uh, Kevin McCarthy did his dear leader routine. Uh, Elise Stefanik also, you know, assured the world how awesome. Where, 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 where should we start with all of this? Let, let's, let's start with, um, uh, let, let's start with Kevin McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy is on comparing the, the, the awesomeness of Donald Trump with, with, with Joe Biden. Let's, okay. Cut number one, Kevin McCarthy. What observations did you, did you see as it relates to the president? Did he see him engaged? Did he have a high level of energy. You've been around Donald Trump. You've been around Joe Biden. What, what's the difference between the two men? Look, this is the first time I saw Joe Biden as president since he's been here. I saw him on the inaugural um, and the State of Union night. He didn't. See, he he was with it, and he and he was engaging, and he was giving me numbers, it. and he was talking. He was talking. But at no time, having known Joe Biden for quite some time, does he have the energy of Donald Trump? We both know it. Donald Trump didn't need to sleep five hours a night and he would be engaged if you called donald trump he'd get on the phone before staff would he'd tell bring other people down yeah awesome superman that that's right this this is how we we evaluate folks uh that Donald Trump didn't need sleep like normal mortals. Okay, so we might, we might as well just follow this up with with Elise Stefanik, who is doing her Elise Stefanik routine. That she's on with Maria Bartiromo, explaining why Donald Trump is so off, awesome and why we need to continue to follow him. Yeah, real quick, Congressman, before you go, President Trump supported you to get the third highest rank uh, in the GOP. How important is he to the party right now? He's critical to the party. He is the leader of the Republican Party. Voters determine the leader of the Republican Party, and they continue to look to President Trump for his vision. And he's going to be an important part of us winning back the House in 2022. All right, we will leave it there. Congrats yeah, okay. again, yeah. Congressman. Yeah. We hope you'll come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, mm-hmm. we, 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 mm-hmm. we don't need Maria. I'm going. Yeah, so President, President. let's just remember what Maria Bartiromo is capable of, right? I mean, oh, you know, during yeah. the during the recount period, during the the post election period, she was on with Trump saying, "This is an outrage. This is the election is being stolen. Tell us more about it, dear leader." I I I, I probably I, I get. I get feedback. I don't know whether you do as well from people who say, why don't you, why do you continue to talk about uh, Donald Trump or uh, feature and amplify the things he said? But I, I think it's important to just to remark on this Monday morning that the former, by the way, former president of the United States, somebody, somebody told at least that he's not the president anymore. He's the <laughs> former president, uh, that he was putting out one batshit crazy statement after another, implying the election was stolen, that uh, Joe Biden is not legitimate, going on about Arizona. In, in fact, it apparently triggered the folks from Maricopa County who just had enough. I mean, they had seen enough. The Republican recorder of Maricopa County put out a uh, put out a tweet saying, this is just unhinged. It's just, it's just one lie after another. Um, and, well, and, and yet, okay, it, let's elaborate yeah, on it yeah, because, please, because please. the way he said it was, was very affecting. He said, this is 
crazy. This is an outrage. He said, the president put out a statement saying that the entire voter list of uh, Maricopa County had been, uh, what did he say, purged or eliminated or, or, or erased or something, yeah. right? And this guy said, I am literally sitting at my computer staring at the voter lists right this minute. Okay. This has got to stop. It's unhinged. And Charlie, of course, you know, we can all say, yay, somebody told the basic truth. Hooray. We have a new Republican hero. And my reaction is, well, yeah, but how did we get to the point where those voices are practically nil? That the entire Republican Party, 70% of it, and most, almost all of the leadership are, are ready to say, yes, the, no. the uh, you know, it is just it, that this nuttery is completely mainstream now. And uh, that's the amazing thing. They're, they're just asking questions, though. Yeah. They're just asking questions. So the, the guy that you quoted, he says, we cannot indulge these insane lies anymore as a party, as a state, as a country. This is as readily falsifiable as two plus two equals five if we don't call this out. Yeah. Well, maybe two plus two is five. Just asking questions. What <laughs> what if two plus two is five? Yep. What I'm, ju- I'm not saying that lots of people are saying there are lots of people who are saying this. Which okay, so let's let's do the Dan Crenshaw. Dan, Dan Crenshaw, who I think is uh, somewhat jealous of the of, of of Elise Stefanik's sellout. I don't know what he's doing. So he's on with with Chuck Todd, and, and Chuck Todd was just not having it. Let's play that. You know, I understand you guys want to put this behind Chuck, you, but Chuck, he is the leader but, of your party, and he doesn't stop talking about this nonsense. Chuck, the only look, he he he's one of many leaders in the party. He's a former president. We're five months into President Biden's presidency. And there is a time to move on. And look, the, 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 you guys in the press love doing this, and, and I and I get it, right? <laughs> the, the, the press is largely liberal, uh, largely no, pro no, 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 Don't start that. That, that, of, that is the la- of, look. There's yeah. nothing lazier. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing there's lazier of, than that. There's a lot of reasons Excuse. to keep this alive. I understand what you're trying to appease. My party that take the bait. I'm not going to take the bait here. I'm not trying I'm to bait you. I'm trying to. I'm trying to try to figure out. Looking for why do you appeal? Why why do you? Why do we sit here and have a, a political party that is basically rallying around this bizarre lie and mythology that the former president is doing? And you guys just want to say, hey, pay no attention to this. That, that, that somehow we and the press are bringing it up. It's no, the already, former president. I already, debunked, I already debunked the notion. I already debunked the notion that there's that there's no space in the party for that. Remember, Liz what? won that first election. She's not there now. She won that first leadership vote. OK. Well, yeah, but and I told you why. I helped you understand why. And, and what I'm trying to help you understand is that, <sighs> yeah, there's plenty of space in the party, and right. you know he goes. See, but so here's the, here's the thing that you have to hold in your mind. Now you have to think that, as Elise Stefanik says, he is. You know, well, Kevin McCarthy, he is he's the great leader who never sleeps. Elise Stefanik, you know, he is the the heart and soul of our party. He's the leader of our party. And then Dan Crenshaw basically saying, yes, he's well, he, you know, why are we still talking about him? We just <laughs> pretend he doesn't. So at the same time, they, they want to cling to Trump while in some cases pretend that, you know, oh, why are you reading his tweets? We don't pay any attention to that. Right. Yeah. Right. Didn't you love what JDL said about the tweets? That was so brilliant. Well, it was. Yeah. 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 Uh, just, just, just to recap, um, he said, throughout the Trump presidency, you had Republicans coming out and saying, well, you know, I don't, I don't judge Trump by his tweets. I mean, yeah, he tweets bad stuff, but, you know, look at the policies. The policies are what we're all about. And, uh, <laughs> and yet, when it came to uh, Elise Stefanik versus Liz Cheney, Liz Cheney, who is rock ribbed conservative, right? Suddenly it was, oh no, we can't have her. She's got to be booted out of leadership because she is, uh, because of her tweets, you know, leaving aside her right. policies. So yeah, yeah. Fr- forget I mean, the policies. Right. Right. Yeah. It was, it was always, low. so speaking of Liz Cheney, this woman is remarkable. I'm just sorry. I just, mm-hmm. She is not backing off. She is. She went on Fox News. I mean, she is not hiding. She is not. She has not run to the MSNBC green room. Raising my hand here. Um, she's she's <laughs> out there, and she's answering questions very directly. I, the contrast between her and Crenshaw, I think, was was kind of interesting. Anyway, so this is Liz Cheney on Fox News yesterday, and I asked this about both McCarthy and. Uh, and and Elise Stefanik, are they being complicit in what you consider the Trump lies? 
They are. And, and I'm, I'm not willing to do that. You know, I think that, that there are uh, some things that have to be bigger than party, that have to be bigger than partisanship. Our oath to the Constitution is one of those. Uh, I've seen countries, I've worked in countries around the world where you don't have a peaceful transition of power. What's happening right now with uh, uh, Donald Trump and, and his continued attacks on the Constitution and the rule of law is dangerous. And, and we all have an obligation to stand up against that. Charlie, I, mm. I have to say um, mm. Mm. that I, I actually think, hey, look, I was critical of Liz Cheney for not being anti-Trump sure. when you and I were, okay? And she kept her head down and, you know, fine. But this action that she is taking now is about the least cynical thing I have ever seen from an American politician. She knows the stakes. She understands completely. She knew, of course, that she was going to be booted out of the leadership. She knows she's likely to lose or could lose her seat in Congress. She's willing to do it all because of the stakes, which she accurately perceives to be monumental, that this is really about our democratic system. It's about the legitimacy of our elections. It's about the, the the continued health of our constitution and our ability to govern ourselves. She sees it and she is doing something that is a pure act of conscience. And I have to say, there must be more people out there like me who listen to that and get a little bit of a stirring in their soul, a little bit of the blood runs a little faster and you suddenly feel like this is someone I could get behind. Yeah. No. A, again, it is deeply uncynical, and I, you know, have to push back against some of the folks on on the left who think, you know, well, because they disagree with her on a lot of different policies, that she's not really a hero. Look, uh, if in fact, as I said, I've said this before on the podcast, if if, if this attack on democracy and on truth is not an a, is is in fact an existential threat, then then treat it like one. Yeah. You've you've had you've had Will Salatin from Slate on your podcast yes. too, right? Yeah, he had a he has a great piece in Slate about this, one of the best. And and he, he, I just want to read one sentence. There's no magic force field around America that protects us from falling into anarchy or tyranny. What protects us, what makes us exceptional, in Cheney's words, is a system of elections, laws, and courts, which in turn relies on enduring popular support for these institutions. Cheney understands how easily this consensus can be shaken. And I think he's he's right about that. And and you know, and he actually kind of connects the dots as she's a, a hawk because she stands up against authoritarian regimes around the world. Why would she not apply the same standard to our own government? So this is the, it, it is a great point, and it's something that um, is ironic um, because one of the reasons that I was drawn to conservatism as opposed to liberalism is that I, it was always my feeling that. Um, Democratic institutions, freedom, uh, individual rights were precious and and easily lost uh, things. That 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 civilization is really quite fragile, um, and that we have to protect it all the time. When Reagan talked about, you know, we're always one generation away from tyranny, that resonated with me. I agree with that. I think it's critical to maintain, you know, to understand that civilization is a fragile thing. And um, this democracy is a fragile thing. We've been unbelievably fortunate that it's lasted as long as it has. But most of them, as the founders knew when they were writing our constitution, most uh, democracies in history had devolved uh, into tyranny. Um, and so it is with particular um, misery that I look at people on the right who call themselves conservative and yet are being as radical as it is possible to be when they are you know playing dice with the constitution and with our democratic system they are risking it all and that is about the most unconservative thing you can possibly do well i i, I agree with you so let's talk about the, like speaking of which the most amazing stories over the weekend Along these lines, by the way, the most amazing story is the 60 Minutes report about the UFOs, which I'm not <laughs> going to get into. I mean, like, wow. I mean, Lordy, there are UFOs. I mean, that's kind of a big deal, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're distracted by a lot of other things. And and yet we just suddenly find out, hey, by the way, we you know, the U.S. Air Force believes that we have been – that we have had visual sightings of alien spacecraft. I mean, you'd think that would be like top five story. It is. <laughs> 
We so, mentioned it on on Beg to Differ last week or two uh, weeks ago, and I got so much mail from people saying, "Yes, yes, do a whole podcast on this." <laughs> okay, I'm really skeptical about all this stuff. Except you saw the I don't know if you've seen the videos yet from from 60 Minutes and these pilots who are saying, "Look at this! This is like wild," and it's like, okay, I'm I'm willing to take a break from Trump and the you know House of Representatives. All of this, I'm willing to focus on you know you know how we're going to handle independence day or whatever. So anyway, the, the other <laughs> my, mind blowing story to bring us back down to earth, uh, Jonathan Swan over at Axios, that Trump's war with his generals, the, the one gobsmacking sentence from that is about the acting secretary of defense, Miller, whose first name I forget at the moment. Miller told associates that he had three goals for the final weeks of the Trump administration. Number one, no major war. Number two, no military coup. Number three, no troops fighting citizens on the streets. And so, wow, <sighs> speaking of which, but in that story, it talks about how Trump basically said, let's get out of every, let's withdraw our troops from every place in the world. And just like, like he scrawled it on the back of something and, you know, handed it to the Defense Department. And they brought in this guy, this former general named Douglas McGregor, to be the, the person who was going to implement the withdrawal from everywhere, who was going to, you know, run roughshod. He's the guy that... Trump had uh, nominated to be ambassador to Germany. And it went nowhere because Douglas McGregor is a complete nut. Um, but he was the president of the United States, nominated to be ambassador to Germany. And over the weekend, I'm not, this is this is where you say, people, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating this. He writes an article for the super Trumpy American Greatness magazine, where he argues in favor of a military coup in France and suggest that we need one in America too. So when you and I are talking about the fragility of democracy, we are talking about people who are in positions of influence and potential authority, who are openly talking about the possibility of overthrowing our democracy and having a military coup. And it's like, are you kidding? And they're doing it in broad daylight. And I wonder if you polled the Republican Party members, uh, you know, coup or no coup to support President Trump, <laughs> how that would come out. Oh, well, exactly. I mean, so I mean, for people who think, are you serious about this? So Douglas McGregor writes in American Greatness, which is very hyper Trumpy, you know, Victor Davis Hanson, a lot of people like that write for it, mm -hmm. he talks about the need for a military coup in France because they need to you know, fight against globalism or something. In France, it seems that destiny now lies in the hands of its national military leadership. What Americans should be asking themselves as we watch the unfolding disaster from across the Atlantic is when, in all likelihood, not if, we will face the same predicament. It is painfully obvious that many, if not most, of the senior military leaders, like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley, are committed to globalism and multiculturalism. I would also say the Constitution and democracy. But one wonders what the majority of patriotic American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, along with the courageous police officers and firefighters across the country, will it really think. What will these guardians of national order and security do when they confront more chaos and disorder on the scale of last summer's criminal violence against American symbols, citizens, and property in the months and years ahead. So, so the woman who came in second in the <laughs> gu gubernatorial race uh, for the Republican nomination in the state of Virginia uh, is somebody who openly declared uh, after the election that Trump should declare martial law and uh, impound all of the uh, voting machines uh, until they could, you know, figure out what the hell is going on, to coin a phrase. She came in second to almost one. Well, Lynn Wood got 28 percent of the vote to be the uh, chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party. And, and he, he makes her seem like Demosthenes. So. Yeah, well. Then. <laughs> yes. So who's the, who's, who's the bigger disappointment, Elise Stefanik or Dan Crenshaw? Oh gosh, Crenshaw! I I I thought uh, when he huh. appeared on Saturday Night Live, that yeah, was a um, bad choice. What? That was a bad choice. Go on. I'm sorry. Well, but, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm reduced to mumbling to myself. So. Okay, no, no. <laughs> this is very when he, he was first elected, and and he did this bit, you know, about we all have to get along and 
I mean, it was very sweet and nice and, and, uh, you know, cross partisanship and all of that. And, uh, I even tweeted it out as I recall that this is, this is great thing, the way things ought to be. Um, and, uh, well, so he, look, they're, they're almost all bitter disappointments, almost all there. You, you just, it's easier to count the people who are heroic, of course. Well, that's, that's right. It, it, it's a lot easier. I, somebody asked that question over the weekend and I, I said, number one, I think at least Stefanik, number two, Dan Crenshaw, uh, number three, rounding, rounding the curve, um, might be Mike Gallagher from, from Wisconsin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but I think mm-hmm. that Dan Crenshaw is really making a bid right now to be the Elise Stefanik's of, uh, Lindsey Graham's. So Yep. You know, stay, stay tuned. All right. So given all of this going on, uh, you and I both signed the same letter. OK, mm-hmm. so we signed that statement of a lot of people with former in front of their uh, titles. Yes. Um, the former official, the um, signed that anti-Trump manifesto mm-hmm. where they said it's time to either fix the Republican Party or move on. Um, lots of lo- lots of big names in all of that. And then us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I kind of had this feeling I'm sitting back looking at this going, okay, you know, at what point do we recognize that there's no civil war anymore? It's done. It's over. And I, I, I was, I, I think what, what triggered me is when I was reading that op-ed piece by, by our friends, these are people I admire greatly. I mean, do, I, I don't, people don't misunderstand me. And they wrote, with Cheney's dismissal from House leadership, the battle for the soul of the Republican Party and our country is not over. It is just beginning. And I think, you know, that's just not true. I mean, in the terms of the Republican Party, it's over. The, I mean, the crackpots, the conspiracists, the Trumpists, they've won. And there's no point pretending that this is a party that can be salvaged. And so there's no civil war. There's just a purge. So, mm. I mean, what what, it, what does it take for our friends to realize you're not going to be able to fix this? I mean, how many signs do we need? How many carries have to, uh, canaries have to die? I mean, how many red lines? I mean, well, no. I, I, I'm with you. Um, yeah. I saw that piece you did for, yeah, yeah. what was it, MSNBC? Yeah, or, yeah, 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 it was a really good piece. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think the Republican Party has let it be known that it is a, it is a cult of personality now and um, really, really thoroughly corrupt and dangerous to, uh, to our society. Um, but I signed that letter, not to express hope for the Republican Party, but to express hope for the principles that they are upholding. Right. um, And to, and then as it, I'm not a political strategist. I don't know how this plays out, but I have to say that if there is a splinter movement within the Republican Party that peels off a certain number of uh, voters of conscience, it makes it harder for Republicans to win elections. And I'm right. fine with that. See, I am too. And, and, and at this point, I don't know what the strategy is and, and I'm prepared to be wrong and I'm prepared to be irrelevant. So I'm, mm-hmm. I, if, I, if this means being an orphan, well, I'm, I've gotten used to it. Right. Um, there, but, and, and also I agree that, I mean, I, I, it's important to support people like Liz Cheney. It's support, it's important to support people like Adam Kinzinger. Um, I would hope that they would commit that they wouldn't vote for Kevin McCarthy to be speaker right. after next year's election. But um, I think the, the the notion that somehow this is going to fix itself anytime soon is uh, is more than a little naive. And by the way, um, Bill, Bill Crystal had a piece last week, and I was reluctant to I was reluctant to to you know in, engage with it because it. I guess I get a little bit tired of always talking about elections and polls. I mean, is is there a moment where we can actually govern? Like do stuff before we have to think about the next election. I mean, mm-hmm, really. Mm-hmm. But there's there are there's straws in the wind out there that would suggest that the political atmosphere is very very good for re- Republicans next year, despite all of the, you know, despite everything they're doing, despite the coups, the conspiracies, the lies, the the purges, and everything. Uh, that the generic ballot for Congress is is pretty even. The Republicans have not lost support. There appears to be some evidence that right now. Uh, Trumpist Republicans are more engaged than any other political group. So the Republican calculation is we can do all this stuff and we're still going to win the majority because our people are going to turn out for us next year. So I don't have any thoughts on all of this. I mean, well, it's deeply cynical, but but they may not be totally wrong. They may not be wrong. I mean, I noticed over the weekend, uh, I have a, one of my three sons was visiting this weekend, so I wasn't as plugged in as normal, but I did 
notice a story about um, these town hall and uh, local Republican meetings throughout yeah. Georgia. Did yeah. you see that? Where yeah, all I did. these I did. newcomers are showing up and they're not newcomers for the Democratic Party. They're newcomers for the Trumpy Party. Um, so that's worrying, really worrying, you know, that uh, uh, well, this kind I, of thing I, is popular. But I think it's important to talk about it now, and I, I don't really, I don't want to depress people uh, about this, but there's also a moment where you need to push back against the irrational exuberance uh, or complacency that sometimes I, I, I sense. I mean, there's this sort of easy punditry of just assuming that when Republicans do stupid things, that that we live in a coherent world where people will regard it as stupid. Not necessarily. No. This stuff, this stuff can actually work for them, and I think we need to acknowledge it. And, and, you know, a lot of the cable commentary is the Republican Party is committing suicide or it's, you know, in a death spiral. Uh, that's not necessarily true. It's not at all and, true. And, I mean, they are and, more likely to win in, in uh, 2022 than the Democrats are. And the reason this is important is there's a faction of Democrats who think that they, because of, and because they have some evidence on their side, Biden's approval ratings are still high. Mm -hmm. Many of these policies poll well, mm -hmm. but there sometimes can be a disconnect between those polls and what happens, you know, during an election. And this is one of the reasons why we need to keep raising our hands and saying these elections are decided by people who are you know, the swing voters, they, they are more moderate than the squad. They are yep. more moderate than the MSNBC green room and that you need to keep that in mind. And there's that pedal to the metal group on, on the left. This basically says, screw those people. We don't need them. Yep. Let's go as hard left as we can and indulge that id. And if they do, I think, I think they are going to be the ones who are reaping the whirlwind and they're, they're constantly in there and they're in their own bubble where they don't understand that, you know, because I mean, again, you, you know, we, we absorb all this stuff and we assume that voters are looking at this and saying the same thing. Not necessarily. No. And uh, like, think back about 2020, um, you know, this was a, a presidency that was a complete train wreck, um, arguably responsible for hundreds of thousands of excess deaths that were unnecessary from this pandemic. Uh, Complete craziness, right? And um, you know, pardoning war criminals and endless list of horrors um, came within what forty four thousand votes in a few states to uh, uh, to being reelected. But I ask you, what would have happened if the Democrats, uh, if there had been, say, no violence after the George Floyd uh, murder? What if there had not been a defund the police uh, chant uh, among among Democrats? What if um, there had not been this effort to claim? I mean, that you can't you can't write this out, but um, but you know the the um, the argument that that apparently had some purchase among the Hispanic voters, many of whom you know a surprising number of whom switched over to Trump. Was the socialism argument? Uh, they they are very resistant. They come from countries like Venezuela and other places, or you know Cuba, or you know they they they've had experience with the real thing, and they don't want anything that even smacks of socialism. And uh, and that's something that you know I don't think the Democrats get. I think even Joe Biden is, though he's pretty you know savvy about about what is politically saleable, and you have to give credit for having perceived when nobody else in the Democratic, almost nobody else in the Democratic field did, that the way to the nomination and to success in the general was sort of down the middle. Uh, but but even he, you know, he's banking on this, you know, all this spending to um, give people stuff. And that once they see that, that's how they, they um, interpret government showing it can work, which means putting money in people's pockets. And, and maybe that's right, but I suspect that that's not the whole thing. I mean, a lot of people will pocket the money and say, yeah, but you know, what about the transgender bathrooms and what about, you know, socialism and what about, you know, the, they critical, will critical, critical race theory, critical race theory. Yeah. I mean, the, and that's not to say that the left has to back away from everything it believes in, but there's a time for, you know, 
in certain districts, I mean, the parties are most successful when they're realistic and when they recognize that in Abigail Spanberger's district, you know, it's better to nominate a sort of center left Democrat who served in the CIA rather than somebody like AOC who wouldn't stand a chance in that district. So anyway. well, exactly. And the other the other thing that so this this morning I'm I'm listening to one of the cable channels that I'm not going to mention by name. Um, but they they have on a, an author who is explaining why defund the police is a good idea. <laughs> and she's asked, well, you know, could you explain what you mean by defund police? And I, I'm not going to say that her argument didn't have certain really salient points, but it's like anytime you're explaining something that polls, you know, in in the radioactive um, you know, wave wavelength. Yeah. Um, you probably need to move on from all of that. So these things are very real dangers. And I'm getting the sense that that they have people who are reassuring one another that none of that stuff hurt them. And um they they will benefit from pushing, you know, the most extreme and I I, I know the, the blowback I'm gonna get on all this, but so I, my newsletter today is is this actually working for the the GOP? And I I put a, a question mark behind that because um I I think it's early days. I think that one of the things we've realized is how uh our politics are contingent upon uh, unpredictable events. All sorts of things can can happen. Mm -hmm. But right now, the Republican base is it may be crazy, um, but they are engaged and they're motivated, and that's and that's a and that's a reality. Yeah. So do you, do you want to talk about what's going on with uh, with Israel and Palestine? <sighs> so it's. Uh got many, many layers of complication. Yeah. Uh, it seems like it, it was a perfect storm in the sense that it, you know, Ramadan is a lunar based holiday. So it moves around in the calendar year and it's in different seasons at, in different years. Um, not always, it's not like Christmas or Easter that are always at the same, same season. Um, and so this year it happened to coincide with, um, Jerusalem Day, which is the day that Israel commemorates the reunification of Jerusalem after the Six Day War, and in which some um, Israelis uh, have taken to marching through the Arab neighborhoods, which may be not such a nice thing to do, a little triumphalism there. Uh, but anyway, that was going on. Uh, the president of Israel, which is different from the prime minister, was giving a uh, a speech in honor of Jerusalem Day, and they asked the Waqaf, which is which controls the um, the uh, Temple Mount area, which is also where the Al Aqsa Mosque is. Mm -hmm. They asked him to please turn down the um, microphone, you know, the, the loudspeakers that they use for the call to prayer, and they were turned down. So then a bunch of Israeli soldiers went up there and cut the cords. Um, great, great, right. So, um, and then, you know, the rocks began to fall and the, you know, rubber bullets and before you know it. So, you know, there's that. And then there's the fact that you've got Abbas in control of the West Bank, who is what, 87 or something and has been, or 89 and has been in his first four year term for 17 years. Um, and, um, completely uh, uh, undemocratic, obviously. And then you have Hamas in charge of Gaza, and they're bidding to be the true leaders of the Palestinians and and uh, seeing the in, what they regard as the ineffectual Abbas weekend, they were hoping you know, that to use this violence as an opportunity to rally people. And of way we go. I mean, so, and then of course you have a, a prime minister in Israel who is... Um, who was unable to form a government and was just about to be booted out. And this violence is actually to his um, benefit tremendous, in some tremendous. ways, right? Yeah. So the whole thing is such a mess. But I will say this. Um, there is this tendency uh, that that's just it's it happens so often that it's just you know it's just a complete rut that that reporters are in and commentators, namely they say you know so so Hamas fires all these missiles into Israel indiscriminately, not caring right. whether they hit women and children, and that's in fact their goal is to hit civilians, right. and Israel fires back and attempts to limit 
civilian casualties, but it's it's inevitable. They say Israel is using disproportionate force. Um, and, you know, it's such an absurd thing to say. You know, if Mexico were firing missiles over the border trying to kill us, uh, you know, we would we would defend ourselves and we have a right to defend ourselves. And uh, so anyway, that's just no, a I, really well, annoying. I, I, I agree. Tip. I agree with you. And I, I there's a there's a piece that I have not fully finished reading in the Atlantic by somebody named Matty Friedman, what the media gets wrong about Israel. The news tells us less about Israel than about the people writing the oh, news. Yeah, former, I think that oh, was a piece from 2014. Oh, it is. I'm sorry. You're correct. I yeah. am sorry. You are looking. It's, he's a former AP reporter. And that that's the one I'm looking at right now. Yes. And, it was a great it's, piece. It's, yeah. it's, well, and and it really does suggest that the need to be somewhat skeptical about some of these these narratives here. Um, but what drives public opinion, of course, in and emotions are those pictures of civilian casualties watching a high rise building go down, um, you know, targeting a building that that has media offices in it. And I'm sensing right now that whatever the merits of the case, um, th this is uh, not a public relations triumph for Israel right now. I'm seeing more negative commentary oh, yeah. than, than I can recall in years. Yeah. More, so, and, 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 and in part, it's because there are a lot of progressives who are willing to be very, very full-throated in, um, in their argument that, that we should not be pro-Israeli. Right. And it's tearing the Democratic Party apart. Right. Um, it's it's very, very clear. I mean, AOC and Bernie Sanders and so on have been very, very uh, outspoken about this in a way I agree that's that's new. Um, but but let me just make the point, because I know it's been made endlessly, but it still needs to be said that um, that Hamas fires at Israeli civilians and uses its own civilians as as human shields so that either way they win. They either kill Israelis, which is their goal, or they look sympathetic and, and, and get a propaganda victory if they lose their own people. So that's just a fact that we should never lose sight of. Um, um, the, the, but the other thing that I would say here is, and my family had actually an argument about this the other night, was, you know, I you could you could have predicted exactly what the international response was going to be to Israel destroying that building that had oh, uh, absolutely. AP in it and and I just think that was their mistake. I mean, yeah, I understood that you know you shouldn't put your you shouldn't put your uh, reporters in a building that Hamas also uses, right? So AP has some some uh, uh, guilt here, but Israel should not have done that because it was just so clear that it was going to be a total propaganda. It couldn't have been, I, in my opinion, and I don't want to be an armchair general, but it just seems like it, it probably, the military value of destroying the building is probably not outweighed by the propaganda loss of hitting some with Western okay. journalists. I, they, of course, nobody was in the building. They gave advance warning, you know, everybody got out, but. Well, yeah. and 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 part of the war is the war for for world opinion. It so is. That, this is this is not an irrelevant thing. It's not like you had to do this, um, you know, despite the the fallout from all of this. Okay, so speaking of the other issue that seems to be coming less clear than 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 clear, I thought we had a moment. We were nearing a mo. It felt like we were nearing a moment of clarity uh, last week when the CDC reversed itself and said, "Hey, you can take the masks off um, under under these circumstances," and now. As, as a couple of days have gone on, it just seems more confusing. Uh, there are reports about how uh, inconsistent the rollout was. The White House was not really given a heads up on it. People are going, wait. So the head of the CDC on one day testifies that she's not going to send her child to summer camp. And the next day says, OK, to take off your masks, but not in under certain circumstances. Now we're seeing one company after another saying, OK, we're dropping our mask mandate. Other doctors are saying this maybe. Where, where, where do you come down on all of this? You know, I, I, I actually, I'll tell you, I did not think that I was um, upset about the um, poor leadership that the CDC has shown throughout this, although it's been, I've, I've commented on it and it's been notable that they've, they've made some big mistakes right from the beginning. Um, but, you know, I figured, all right, you know, they, they, that's disappointing, but but then when when they announced, you know, that, that if you're fully vaccinated, you can go maskless, I, you know, triumphantly tore off my yeah, mask. I was in me. an airport and I didn't wear it. And then when they reversed themselves or when they backtracked and so on, I really got annoyed and thought, look, 
we do rely on you. We do rely on you to give us, you know, information that we can act on and don't screw it up, you know, just make up your minds and stop changing the story. I mean, it was really one of the worst aspects about this pandemic, honestly, and this was something that the Trump people said, but that doesn't mean it wasn't true, which is that in the early days, they didn't say, don't wear a mask because uh, we need to, to, to husband our supplies for healthcare workers. They didn't say that. They said, it won't help you. It doesn't matter, you know? And that's terrible, right? They were but that, lying. That's, that's the tell, that, that, that the noble lie that they sort of gaming things out or maybe they overthink things. So they're saying things because they're afraid that people won't understand them or won't behave in the way they want them to behave. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's, that's a huge moment. And you kind of wonder whether or not they continue to say these things because they have some sort of, you know, tertiary motive. Yeah. That we don't necessarily, you know what I'm saying? It's exactly. like, you just be straight with us? Exactly. Because, okay, you're you're uh, you're vaccinated, right? I mean, yes. the vaccine. Yes. And the and the reality is is that we are we we are kind of super people now. Yes, we are. <laughs> I mean, we are. <laughs> and I would, but I was listening to a guy, a doctor, um, earlier today, saying, you know, um, we shouldn't be telling people that there are still you know dangers. They still need to be careful. Of you are not immune. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Wait. Okay. You know, what is the messaging? Either these vaccines work or they don't work. If they work, it should lead to dramatic changes in behavior and the risk factors, how much risk you you are taking and how much risk you are willing to take. Don't say that the vaccines are this miracle drug that um, are amazingly effective, which I believe they are, and then say it doesn't have dramatic world life changing consequences. Absolutely. And they can't seem to and they can't seem to reconcile that. Right. And furthermore, think about the incentives, right? We want the maximum number of people in this country to be vaccinated in order to get to herd immunity, right? Um, For the sake of those people who, because of some underlying medical condition, and there are such people, cannot take the vaccine, right? So we want the maximum number of people to get vaccinated. And if the message is, yes, get vaccinated, but then, you know, you still kind of have to be careful and you have to wear a mask. That's not, that's not going to encourage people to do this thing which should be liberating and is and can be if they'll just be honest. I find it weird and and I I understand that people have pushed back after I wrote a piece about bring on the vaccine passports that maybe the term vaccine passport is is not the right terminology. I know that Frank Luntz has said that he's tried that in focus groups and people think of that as elitist. Okay, fine. I don't care what the term is, but proof of vaccination. Mm-hmm. The, the the weird resistance and opposition to that when in fact proof of vaccination has been a norm in our society for decades when it comes to children in schools, international travel, et cetera. If the goal is to incentivize people to get vaccines, to make people confident that they can return to these big venues, then isn't some sort of a proof of vaccine exactly the route we should be taking? Absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I have no problem with it. I had, I raised three children and had to present their uh, vaccination forms to the school every September meant the last thing we did in the summer was make sure they had that pediatrician visit, make sure they were up to date. I mean, it's just that simple. Well, it is that simple, and you know all the pushback. Well, well, you know this is authoritarianism, and this is the this is the uh, you know big government, uh, big brother. Well, no, actually, I, I'm not talking about government doing it. I'm talking about private actors, private entities that would do it. If in fact you knew that you could only attend the NBA finals if you had proof of vaccination, or you could only go to you know certain sections of the ballpark and do that. Yeah. This is both, a, this is a carrot and a stick, yeah. but, it, but it's also rational that if I'm around people who are vaccinated, it's going to lead to a higher level of safety. Now, I understand that people say, well, why should you care? If you're vaccinated, you're Superman anyway, right? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But there are people who are not able, I mean, look, there, there are, there, there are still residual dangers out there to other people. And if I made the decision not to care about other people, you know, like Ron Johnson says, why should we care about our neighbor? Well, I don't know. I kind of thought that was one thing we did as a society. 
you know, um, mm-hmm. then I think these things are, are still positive. Well, know, and by positive. the way, I mean, there is a huge group of people who are vulnerable that we don't talk about much, but they're children under the age of 12, right? So the vaccine mm-hmm. have now, vaccines have been approved for those 12 to 17, I guess, but, um, but not yet for children younger than that. And while this particular virus is not nearly as dangerous for young people, that doesn't mean it's never dangerous for young people. There are cases of little kids getting it and little kids dying of it. Um, so, you know, for their sake, uh, even if it's a small number, it's, it's worth it. So what else is on your mind these days? What are you, what are you thinking about this week? <sighs> well, I'm, uh, uh, what am I? I'm actually writing a piece, uh, for a new Jewish magazine that's edited by, um, Brett Stevens. So I'm, I'm thinking Jewish Wait, thoughts. Brett, Brett Stevens is editing his own magazine now? Yes, he is. It's a new magazine called Sapir, S-A-P-I-R. Oh Just my. had its first issue. Yes. I, I, I had, I had no idea. Yeah. I, I because I I, I, I want to force myself to um, pay more attention to UFOs, uh, <laughs> but 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 one 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 last thought. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see this vote this week in the House of Representatives um, on the on the nine eleven style commission for January sixth. That it has bipartisan support, but um, I'm willing to go out on a limb and saying that the vast majority of Republicans are going to. Uh, come out against it because they don't want to talk about January 6th. They want to memory hole it. Um, they don't care uh, to find out what the truth is. And they, they're going to protect uh, Kevin McCarthy from having to testify under oath. Wait, so, let me let me guess, Charlie. The commission is going to be rigged. Of course it's going to be rigged. It's, go- <laughs> it, it, it's, it's going, you know, you know what I would like to do in, 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 a, in a perfect world, in a perfect world, which we do not live in, if you right. is when you have the Elise Stefanics or the uh, Dan Crenshaws on, I would I would love to have one of the anchors hand him a copy, assuming this wasn't remote, of the latest missive uh, from you know the the Orange Versailles down in Mar-a-Lago, mm-hmm. and say, would would you read that? Donald Trump wrote this, <laughs> and and uh, Elise Stefanik, could you just read what he wrote there? And 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 now I want you to comment on why you um, are in a party led by this man and why he should be the the lodestar of the party. Because I think that there is that, we talked about this right at the beginning, that that cognitive dissonance, that yes, we're with him, but we're going to pretend that he's not actually doing what he's doing. Yeah. You know, at some point that's got to come back together again, but but who knows whether, whether it will. Um, so by the way, I just need to mention this, um, you know, Kudos to uh, Bill Crystal for giving me some good advice on TV binging shows. Oh, um, because of Bill Crystal, I have gone through all three seasons of Broadchurch. Oh, I have yeah. gone th- gone through Hinterland as well, which is excellent. That's set is in it? Wales, okay. Shetland, which is set on the Shetland Islands. Which, if you if you want to go look on the map, it's it's it's, it's <laughs> where the Shetland Islands are, and um, thanks to many of our listeners, um, overwhelming number of our listeners, who recommended watching the British police uh, series Line of Duty, huh. which is amazing. But I will warn people that Line of Duty is very different than the other ones, much much more intense, um, as opposed to the quieter tone of some of the other ones but these are all absolutely outstanding series that, that frankly i would not have watched them had bill not uh, mentioned them and he's, he's also mentioning scott and bailey which i've just um i, I have it queued up so for for people who w- want ways of of dropping out so i don't know why i'm spending well, all my time I, watching well, murder murder shows but you know that's yeah, you know, no no it's know. a fantasy no listen i <laughs> <laughs> I uh, <laughs> I want to say that I am always in need of something gripping, some s- gripping series to watch because I watch it while I'm exercising and I don't like exercising. So I want to be just taken away and have something that can completely distract me so I can get my exercise out of the way. And the thing that I used through, I think it was five or six seasons that I really liked was um, a French series called The Bureau. 
mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I don't know if you've heard of, but it's incredibly well done. Now, it does have subtitles, so you have to pay attention. You can't look away. But the acting is tremendous. The stories, it's, you know, former spies have said it's very realistic. So, um, I, I, you know, within reason. But uh, but I found that incredibly great drama. And it's it's a little violent for me, but not too much. So yeah, if, if you're into hyper, I mean, that's why the the line of duty, which is the British police thing, uh, police uh, series is is much more overtly violent um, than the other mystery shows. Although mm-hmm. I, I will I will say that the Broadchurch and Hinterland are more gripping than some of the quieter you know, doily and uh, cucumber sandwich, uh, British murder mystery. But okay, here's a confession yeah, uh, and, a, and a warning, particularly when you're talking about Hinterland, um, which is set in Wales. And they'd have a Welsh version of it, which just blows my mind. Oh, in um, Welsh? Yeah, yes, in Welsh. Oh, they they oh. come up with two of the same series. They come up with two different versions, one in Welsh, one in English. Interesting. Um, but they have heavy accents. Same thing with Shetland. That that if you have the ability to have subtitles, subtitles on, it was, I mean, yes. I know it's the it's the English language, but my wife my, my 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 wife is really really good with languages. But we look at each other going, you know, we would not be able to watch this without the subtitles <laughs> because otherwise it would be the constant. What did they just say? What I missed that. There what was is what? <laughs> the most hilarious Saturday Night Live bit about this about attempt you know asking for english subtitles for a british murder mystery yeah, yes i'll have to find it and send it to you it's hilarious yeah uh, because we all have that issue yes yeah. <laughs> absolutely required for the welsh series and for the shetland series just just saying <laughs> mona Sharon, thank you so much for kicking off our week i appreciate it very much my pleasure and thank you all for listening to today's bulwark podcast i'm charlie sykes we'll be back tomorrow and as you know we'll do this all over again